How many of you guys have ever seen a shuttle launch in the air on TV? Yeah, some of you? Okay. Um, when I was a kid, this is like a big deal. Like, I don't know what it is. It, sometimes they would play it in our schools and we'd just all stop at the playground and everything. We would just watch the shuttle, the shuttle being launched. And so um, I don't know how many there are. I know some of them, unfortunately, didn't make it all the way up in the air and there were casualties. But there's what's called a shuttle what? countdown, a sequence that they go through. There's a number of things, beginning weeks out and then coming down to the last nine minutes. And <clears throat> at nine minutes, they basically check all the functions correctly, make sure things are all good. And they check the weather cast at Cape Canaveral to make sure the weather conditions are just perfect for a launch. At seven minutes and 30 seconds, at this point, the command will be to retract the orbiter access arm, that's the arm in which the astronauts are able to get into the shuttle. They retract that at two minutes. The shuttle, the shuttle commander will advise his or her crewmates to put on a visor because, you know, when the shuttle launches, this is big blaze of light and heat, so they have special visors that protect them at T minus 31 seconds. At this countdown point, they, <clears throat> they want to check and make sure there's no technical issues right before they give the go command. At T minus six seconds prior to this moment, everything should be functioning good, and it should be a green light to ignite the shuttle's main engines. And that <clears throat> at this same point, <clears throat> excuse me, three main engines will be ignited, and a big roar of life comes to these engines. And then T minus zero seconds the solid rocket booster will be ignited and the bolts that have secured the shuttle to the ground will be actually exploded, explosively released, allowing the orbiter to rocket into the sky. And all this, when all this happens, you have liftoff. So where am I going with this? This is a liftoff of a shuttle and there's a countdown sequence. As we've been looking through this section of Genesis 5 and 6, now we're tiptoeing in chapter 7, we've been in a countdown sequence from 120 years. Um, actually, now the time has passed. There's been a lot of sin. Noah has received a message that God is going to wipe out the world because of man's sin and rebellion. And now they're down to seven days. And so <laughs> during this course of time, I don't know everything that happens, but if you just kind of read through the passage, you surmise that in this ungodly generation, people that did not like Jesus, they lived for their own, they ate, drank, and were their own king, but there was one man and his family that sought to remain faithful for these 120 years. Think about this in this way. Um, <clears throat> he's told to make this ark. I mean, <clears throat> it's not even a boat. It doesn't have any, you know, propelling or ways. There's no beauty to it. And <clears throat> a decade goes by, and there's no, there's no ocean. There's no lake or river nearby. Imagine the persecution he gets in decade one. Maybe not too much. Only, it's only one decade. But your own situation, how you persevere, man. Oh, man, this is so hard. It's been a week. I'm going through fill in the blank. Oh, it's been a month, and I'm about to fall apart spiritually because it's been a month. Well, he's, he's functioning instead of months. He's functioning in decades. It's been two decades. It's been three decades. It's been five decades. There's no rain, and I'm sure the intensity is increasing. People are mocking him. What are you doing? You're chopping all our trees. Aren't, aren't you green? I mean, why are you killing all our trees? I'm just kidding, right? This is today's language. Or maybe I come from Berkeley. We, we, we want to be green-oriented. Well, he's chopping down a ton of trees. Um, more decades go by. Maybe his wife and kids are getting a little impatient. Dad, man, why do we got to work on this all the time? I mean, his wife is super faithful, but you're 100. She complains just a little bit, and then she repents. I don't know. But a lot of time goes by. Noah's preaching. Noah's building. And there's no sign of rain. There's no sign of his judgment. I think Noah's wasting his life and wasting all his time. But what? He remains faithful. He remains faithful to obey what God said to do. To build an ark with 
specific measurements, not just to save their own family, but to reset all of humanity with land life and air life in play. At, um, I just want to give a quick side note as you find these interesting things when you're in 2012, there was a man by, Johan, by the name of Johan, and he was a Dutch man um, in the Netherlands area. He built a life-size ark that actually moves and has propelling <coughs> abilities. It took four years, made out of American cedar and pine. He spent 400 million euros on this. I don't know how to translate that to American dollars. You might. And he used 12,000 trees. So, there you go, that's a lot of trees. I mean, I'm sure there'll be a protest over killing all the trees. I mean, I'm unhappy that my neighbor used to, used to have a lot of trees. They just plowed it all down and they're putting houses and stuff. Because why? Too many people are moving here. But that's what's happening. So, there's that. Have you ever heard of this guy? Yes? No? I can't tell. Yes, have we heard of this one? So this is another arc that's out there. Life size, same size as Dick, Dick depicted in Genesis. And the one that we're more familiar with is the Ark Encounter in Kentucky. So this is one by Ken Ham. It's life-size. My, my family's been there. For us, it was super encouraging. There's a couple pictures. Click. And this is Christmas time. They deck it out. Click. This is the outside. It's a little bit more than the football field. And it's actually an amusement park. There's more sectors to it. You should check it out online. Click. This is what it looks like inside. And there's three stories tall, and that's the last. So you know, if you have time during spring break or summer, it's, it's worth hitting the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. So I, I am doing a shameless plug. Um, and I think it will encourage your faith, and it's worth the thirty or forty dollars for admission. But you get more going out, of, going here spiritually than you will going to the other kingdom that costs about 100 bucks per person in the Florida area. We won't name what that is, all right? <clears throat> you can spend a lot of money or some money here. So there you go, a shameless plug for, to encourage your faith. But here we are. We're at four countdown <coughs> sequences here. Now that we're in Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And <coughs> that day is coming very quick. They're one week out. I don't know what you would think. If you were a week out and you knew the world was going to end, what would you do? Most people do one of two things. They will either remain faithful, or this guy will say, I don't care, I'm just going to do whatever. I'm sin a whole bunch more at this moment. But I want you to see what God does at this moment and how Noah responds in this moment. Count number two, got the final embarking. Count number two is God's final instructions. And countdown number three, we'll look at seven days till, a few more details here. And then we'll look at countdown four would be the, the final reasons. God's thinking behind this as he's relating to Noah's family. So I'm going to go through the first three points quickly by design. We'll see how that works. And then sport, spend more time on the first fourth point. So countdown number one is found in verse seven. Uh, we know that in the previous verse, Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, that the ark was completed. It has been completed on time. You know, there's no holes in this ark. It's ready to float. <clears throat> and we know it's big enough to hold about 125,000 average sheep. Um, <clears throat> and so you just kind of break that down and what that would look like. And so in verse chapter, um, Genesis chapter 7, one, we're at this point finally where it says here, then the Lord said to Noah, I mean, I don't know if Noah, God needed to say to Noah, I mean, Noah's been building this ark for a while, over a century, more of the years than we're ever going to live. I think he knows this ark was made for him and his family. But the Lord in his directive and kindness, a little bit of both there, he says specifically to Noah, go into the ark. There's an invitation to go into this ark that had no sails, um, it had no controls. Is this going to float one day? And it'll provide the maximum stability for his family and for everyone in the ark. A few more details about this ark. It was made in such a way that it would not capsize. 
Um, it was made with one million, one and a half million cubic feet of capacity, and <clears throat> this ark was specifically made. In this case, as God is speaking to Noah, it was made for some key people. Well, we'll see here that as God addressed Noah, this ark was a command. This command was to Noah and his family to go into the ark, you and your family. Noah's wife, Noah's three kids and their three three sons and their respective spouses. So, um, why are they welcomed on this boat? Because in the midst of an ungodly generation, they were the only godly and righteous eight people. And so we see in the last part of verse one. God gives a reason, one of the reasons, and we'll get more of it at verse 5. He says this, For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. On this very quality and this very attribute, um, Noah and his family has demonstrated <coughs> the character of being righteous in an unrighteous world. And so God recognizes, and for that reason, And so Noah, Noah basically had an upright character, um, and this isn't something that mirrored his, his salvation, um, but showed him as distinct um, in relationship to the generation he lived in. But what did merit his salvation, I believe, is his faith and trust in this season, in this time, specifically a trust not in his own abilities to make an ark and save himself, but a trust in God himself. Today we look back to the cross, um, believing that Jesus is on the cross for our sins, for salvation. For the Old Testament, excuse me, they looked forward to the promised Messiah. And they get glimpses and had glimpses of it in the Old Testament of a a future Messiah, a one who had come and one who had redeemed. And so Noah <clears throat> baked on the one and true redeeming God. So Noah's heart was for God. His in God is demonstrated in his faithfulness and his righteous conduct. So my question for all of us living in his age, how will we respond? How do we respond when it is on? And everyone's going the way. Uh, but God calls us to remain faithful. Mock you. You Christian, or you, you moralist, or you think you have it right because you just don't drink, or you think it right because you don't have sex before marriage, and you're just constantly being mocked, and you're like, oh, maybe I'm missing out on something. Let's go drink. Let's have sex. Or whatever. I mean, there's a number of ways you can look at this, and you crumble. How do you respond when the temptation is hard, that you're going through trials? Maybe someone is dying or have a disease, and it's been difficult. And it's not just that. It's like my mom is sick, and then my dad is sick, and then my sibling is sick, and then it goes on and on. And it's like, how much more can I handle? And now I'm with a terminal disease. And you're like, God, are you even there? Those are many temptations to what? to toss in the towel with God and say, I don't want this anymore. I'm going to give up. It's more personal than that. There's closer ones to you in your life, those who betrayed you and you expected them to be with you. Will you remain faithful? Countdown number two, final instructions here. Um, in Genesis chapter 6, verses 16 and 20, God gave the command to Noah, to bring animals of every kind, two by two, to replenish the earth. In this section, in chapter 2 and 3, God gives a little bit more detail, and he's specifically pointing out particular animals. He's basically, I just see the section, it's the same call, but a few more deals, um, details, expansions, um, <clears throat> instructions in this section. So verse 2, Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, 
the male and his mate, which be, would be the female. Um, here it says, take with in other words, it's seven pairs. This is how they write it in the Hebrew language in that sense. It goes, and a pair of the animals that are not clean. So there's seven pairs of clean animals and then one pair of not clean animals, one male, one female. A pair and, and seven pairs of the birds of the heaven, so male and female, to keep their offsprings alive on the face. I like what God is doing. I can explain the whole sacrificial system here. I would just encourage you to read into Leviticus particularly. But to understand what God is doing here, um, <clears throat> and he's making some distinctions between what God values, that which is unclean, a male and female to be taken out. He said everything. Why? Because they will be and <clears throat> everything will be wiped out except for these that are on the ark. So what is this purpose of cleaning? Um, and I don't know what you think about this as you thought through the Old Testament. You know, is it because some animals are dirtier than others? Does it have to do with health condition and hygiene? Um, does it help? Does it, does it, is it a matter of the type of animals you eat? In terms of dietary issues, I would say that it's to a certain degree, yes and, and no. Um, <clears throat> you might say, is it deal with the physiological aspects of the animals? Yes and no, but not all the way. I think God is pointing to a deeper and bigger truth here, and <clears throat> and we're going to tiptoe right into it. As you look at the sacrificial system, as you think through, if you're a little bit familiar with the Old Testament. Ask yourself this basic question, as a sacrificial sacrifice lambs and goats and so forth, did this system wipe out and take away permanently? Our some understanding of like the Day of Atonement, I believe, Leviticus 16, there was a Day of Atonement, and the Atonement was good for a period of time, but not permanently. It was not a, a lasting Atonement to, to forgive sins and to wash away sins. It brought some forgiveness, but it wasn't the final answer. It wasn't a perfect answer. And so the answer is yes and actually no. The sacrificial system did not solve and resolve man's problem with God. And so it pointed to what? A need for a greater Savior, a greater Redeemer, a greater sacrifice. And so as God <coughs> went through a messy season of slaughtering animal after animal and after, after animal, I think there's a couple things that kind of stand out to me in this whole process of preparing to sacrifice animals. The animals, before their sacrifice, a priest, the highest qualified priest would be involved of, of confessing their sins day in and day out, <coughs> holy as they possibly can be before God. And so there's a sense that God wants what? He wants our soul. He wants our, he wants our heart. He wants us to be yielded to Him. He wants us to be submitted to Him. Ultimately, God made us for worship, and He wants what? Worship that is honoring to Him. Worship that is distinct and holy. Where am I getting that from? That's the whole clean and aspects of the sacrificial system. Why does he go through this over and over and over? I believe what the Lord desires is uniqueness, distinctness, set-apartness, a holiness, and an unholy world that we would set apart ourselves for him. And so that's what I see the Lord going in the whole sacrificial system as he declares over and over, take with you every <coughs> clean animal, a seven, male, and female. He's setting us up and helping us to understand our need and how we fall short because of our sin. And we need what? Someone else beyond us, a, a mediator, a savior, ultimate sacrifice. And so that's what's happening in a summary fashion in, in point two as he talks about clean and unclean animals. I believe the Lord values that which is clean, that which is holy, that which is set apart. 
as the day of judgment is coming soon. Countdown number three is the final days. In <clears throat> verse four, the <clears throat> God declares to Noah the following. For in seven days, so to down to seven days, God says, I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Okay? And every living thing that I had made, the Lord created, the Lord made, the Lord says in the first person, I will take responsibility. I will blot out um, all of humanity. Because what? Sin is running rampant. They're not functioning in a holy and godly way. They have broken my law. They have offended my holiness and my justice. And God said, <clears throat> he has been patient for a long time. He's given Noah to preach. And the time has come where God is going to execute and follow through on what he said he's going to do. He's going to bring forth judgment. Um, in the Old Testament, seven is a common number, and so is 40. Seven is seen in a number of ways. In this case, it's seven days until the flood will come. We see 40 in the Old Testament, a number of times Moses remained in the mountains 40 days. Jesus also fasted for 40 days. Israel sent the spies in the land for 40 days. God has some orientation toward these numbers. Well, remember them. God is at work when you see seven and when you see 40. I want you to know as God says he will blot out, God's not making vain threats. Sometimes parents go, I'm going to spank you, and what? I'm going to spank you. And the kid thinks, I'm going to get my parents to say, I'm going to spank you 50 times before you actually spank me. Okay, God doesn't work that way. I'm just being silly. Some parents think that. So it's funny. No, nah, I don't want to go there. <laughs> God does this, and he's not saying in vain. He's going to punish um, sin and lawless and rebellion. He's not going to shriek back from his responsibility. God will follow through and he'll blot out. And how will he do that? He will do that by sending rain. Um, the rain here um, in the Hebrew is from the word matar and it's referring to normal rain. But you jump down to verse 20, you see another word for rain. It's guess him. Guess him is torrent rain, this downpour of rain. So he starts out with easy, normal rain that we experience. And he, God says, you know, eight verses later, I'm just going to lay down and pour out the rain even faster, even harder. So that's our first three points leading up to this, where I want to spend a little bit more time. Is this basic statement yet profound? In verse five, we saw this in verse, in chapter six too. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. This is a huge deal. The Lord And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So we see that we know that Noah's righteous because why? He did all that the Lord had commanded him. He was faithful in an unfaithful generation. He was godly in an ungodly generation. And so I wanted to dig deeper and closer to see what's going on um, with Noah here. What kind of faith did he have? So come with me to Hebrews chapter 11. I believe it's on the screen. If not, just, you know, let your fingers do the walking to Hebrews or, you know, use your phone and get there. If, since you're not doing it, I assume it's on the screen. So Hebrews chapter 11, this is where we're going to conclude. But I want you to ask yourself, what is the nature of faith that God desires for us to live out. What is the nature of faith? And so we see it demonstrated multiple times, even already up to, the, up to Noah with um, Adam and I believe with Abel. So in verse 1 or 11.1, 1, we get a definition, a functional definition of what faith looks like. And it says here, And now faith is the insurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. In Noah's, Noah's case, right, he didn't see the signs of any kind of flood coming and any worldwide catastrophe, but trusted God, 
for what he assured that would happen, and he walked in faith. And so this type of faith described here involves the most solid possible conviction, the God-given present assurance of a future reality. For us today, we're living this way, hopefully, with the reality that what? God will come back one day, and we're trusting that there is a a heaven on the other side of this life with Jesus. And so we're living in light of this promise, this salvation of future glory. And so that's part and the nature of faith. We're clinging on to a future reality, and that affects how we live now. Okay? Maybe in a kind of simple way, I've used this before in different settings, but when couples are engaged and they know they're going to be married in a year, they live differently. They make all these preparations, right? They're going to, the gal's trying to figure out, you know, if I'm going to keep my name or get rid of my name, and if I'm going to change my license or my social security. Thing. But they also relate to people different. If the guy had a lot of girlfriends or she had a lot of boyfriends, you know, they're distancing them, distancing, hopefully. You know, they're not talking to them. They're not doing one-on-ones with other previous girlfriends and boyfriends. And as the days get closer, because of that date's coming, they're changing a lot of stuff. They had maybe two apartments and a house. They're consolidating. They had two microwaves, right? They're eliminating one, right? Ch- their lifestyle is changing because of that future date. And that's not even a sure date, right? There could be what? A pandemic, and you have to change your date or have your wedding on Zoom or something like that. All right? <laughs> we have this sure date in the future, and we live differently. There's a lot of changes we do in light of what? The future date of Christ's return. Same for what? Noah, in light of this future, sure, future hope, he's living differently. He doesn't have time to do what everyone else in the world is doing at that time. A lot of sinning. He needs to build this ark. And so, we see in verse 2, For by it, by faith, the people of old, referring to those in the Old Testament, received their commendation. They receive their acknowledgement of their faithfulness from God himself. Verse 3 caught my attention. It kind of just, I haven't really looked at this verse for a long time, but it kind of like went like this to me. What? Verse 3 says this. By faith, we spent a lot of time last year in the first part of Genesis. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. We take that on by faith. Not by logic, even though we might apply some. Uh, Not by science, even though some people want to jam a lot of science in there. The scripture clearly says it is by faith we understand that the universe, that the world was created by the word of God. Hey, none of us were there. Moses wasn't even there. (laughs) Methuselah, whatever his name was, who lived almost a thousand, he wasn't there at the creation of the world. So that what is Seen was not made out of things that are visible. Okay? In other words, when the world was made, it was made, everything was out was made out of nothing. I think God was there and existed eternally, and there wasn't a big bang. No one even can acknowledge it was there. No one, no scientist was there. I was there, you know, recording this and watching this big bang. I have it on my, you know, FaceTime. It's not there. No one has any, any empirical data like that. We take it at face value, not at face value, we take it at faith value. Not face value, but faith value. We trust, we trust the word of God that he indeed made this universe. Okay? It's the only way to take it. And so, the same power that created the universe is the same power that what? Raised Jesus from the dead. It is the same power that what makes us New creation. And so we can walk through that backwards too. Verse 4, 5, and 6. We, we've walked through this earlier in Genesis. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, though which he was com- <coughs> commended as righteous. A- Abel was commended as righteous for offering his sacrifice. By commending God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, still speaks. 
verse 5. By faith was taken up, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. People try to look for his body on earth. They could not find him because what? He went straight to heaven. Now before he was taken, he was what? Commended having pleased God. Having pleased God. So we're going to get to some distinctions of faith right now. Verse 6 is where we're going to camp on. The author of Hebrews says something very profound here. He says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. It is impossible to please God. For whoever draws near to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So, I want to delineate a few different aspects of faith. There is saving faith. Saving faith is basically saying, hey, I recognize I'm a sinner, and I'm going to trust the finished work of Jesus Christ or promised Messiah to save me and deliver me. Okay, there's that level of faith, that type of faith. There's passive faith. Okay, many of us don't think about this, but, you know, passively we live on God's common grace. We enjoy air that we can breathe, and we enjoy this all the time. Whether we acknowledge God or not all the time, we probably don't. I mean, it takes a lot to acknowledge God constantly. Thank you for this air. Thank you for this air that I'm breathing. It's, it's so good. But passively, we're living on this type of faith. Okay? Right here, I see a different type of faith, a faith that pleases God. And so my question is, what type of place, faith that uniquely pleases God? And so we could call this the type of faith that pleases God, or I'll call it an, an active faith because Abel, because Enoch and Noah actively pleased God in their life. They walked with God. And I want you to see the distinction of this type of faith. So as we walk in this, as I, as I explained verse 6, I want you to ask this question. Does my life please God? Or am I living in such a way that this may be true, unfortunately, and without faith it is impossible to please God? Are you functioning and living in such a way that I'm not pleasing God. So what does it look like, according to verse 6, to please God? Well, in the middle part and the latter part of verse 6, you get a strong clue of what it means to please God actively. And the first thing I would like to highlight, it says, for, everyone, for whoever would draw near to God. So what does it mean to draw near to God? So it's not active. It's not passive, excuse me. It's actively saying, I'm going to draw near to God. I'm going to draw my thoughts to God. I'm going to actually open God's Word the other six day and read God's Word. I'm going to li listen and read attentively, not always passively. Um, in other ways, you may read, but actively draw near to God. And you might think <clears throat> the other aspect of drawing near to God is being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Many times we're like, you know, we have so much going on, we don't even think about the Holy Spirit. So in some parts of Christianity, our tribe says, we don't even believe in the Holy Spirit. What's that? But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity and is a legit person of the Trinity. It's same status, same role as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons in the, in the, in the Godhead. Okay? That's the triune God. That's the Trinity right there. And so what does it mean to draw near to God? Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never tells you to sin. I want you to know that. The Holy Spirit tells you what? To delight in me, to obey God's word, to follow God and what he says. Even it means that it's not popular and people don't like it and it's not cool and you might face persecution at school, at work, and other places and then people might call you names. You take on that. Okay. Draw near to him privately. Draw near him with other people. Draw near him in community. Draw near him as a church. I'm with him as a church. And he says another thing that you must do. You must believe that he, God, exists. It's not just facts in your head. You're acting on these facts. So first, you must believe that he exists. Um... I know that there are certain things that you believe exist because you relate to these things. 
Like, you, you believe your cell phone exists because, what, it's there, I can touch it, and it interacts with me. All the more, God exists. He is everywhere. His presence is with us. And the question is, do you acknowledge Him and relate to Him? Or do you act as if He does not exist? Or you only act as if He exists when, what, things that are bad that happens. Um, do you believe that He exists? And do you act if he, as if he exists? And it's just not a matter of acting and believing if he exists. True belief is manifested as you look at everyone in the hall of faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11. They didn't have this passive faith where just kind of take it for granted, I have air to breathe. No, they actively pursue the Lord. I mean, think of Abraham and Isaac was an active faith, all right? Noah had an incredibly active faith for 120 years. That's active faith. Every day he woke up and he says, I'm going to live and trust the Lord. I'm going to serve him. And so, see that this is a type of faith that what? God rewards. He blesses, he honors those who actively step out and seek him, believe that he exists, and <clears throat> I, I'm going to te- tease him a little bit more. They seek him. They pursue him. They go after him. They follow him. There's a number of things that we do when we need help, right? Who do we call? Ghostbusters. Who do we call? I don't know. Our friends. Our friends. Our other friends. Our other friends. And you call friends and text so many friends, but didn't call Jesus yet. Who do you seek? And so this is a type of faith that pleases God. One that draws near to God, that believes that God exists and that seeks Him. Some of us function in a way that maybe our type of faith does not, does not please the Lord. And so I want you to think about this. Do you seek Him? Do you seek His character? Do you seek Him in worship? Do you adore Him? Do you fast? What's fasting? No, that's only for the pastor to do. No, it's for all of us. Okay, what's prayer? That's for all of us. Not just the select few of three or two or whatever. No, prayer is for every one of us to participate in. And so, as you look at verse 7, by faith. Noah being warned by God concerning events yet unseen. God could deal with the things that are unseen. What? Because he's eternal and sees all. So he could confidently tell us what's going to happen down the road. And we could trust in his good character. In reverent fear, Noah constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith, by faith alone. So a few questions. Do you have an active faith or a dead faith? Are you remaining faithful? Do you truly believe? See, you can't just say, many Christians think they've arrived because they go, I know the gospel. Knowing the gospel is only half the deal. Living the gospel is the part that counts. Right? You can know it, and you can say, I know the gospel, but what counts is what? If you do the gospel, you experience the gospel, you live it out. And so the only way I can illustrate this, and we can go testimony after testimony, um, and we can share stories, and I'm out of time, and I don't know what else to say, but I'll just continue this next week. I want you to ask yourself, does my faith represent a faith that is pleasing to God? Let's pray and let's stand and sing our heart out. Father, we thank you so much for this time to consider to live faithfully in an unfaithful world. Help us, Lord Jesus, to trust in you and that actively pursue you 
and actively walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray.